Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the public lecture this afternoon organized by the Institute for Mathematical Sciences. My name is Chong Chi Tat. I'm the director of the, uh, Institute, of the Math Institute for Mathematical Sciences at NUS. And this is the first uh, public lecture that the IMS is organizing. And this is uh, under the Ngkong Beng Memorial Fund uh, public lecture series. We are very happy this afternoon to have uh, uh, Professor Anton Zora from University of Paris, seven, um, in Paris, from France. Professor Zora is a distinguished professor at, at the University of Paris and uh, is very well known for his work uh, that is at the intersection of uh, uh, dynamical systems, geometry, and the topology. And he's also well known for doing uh, experiments on a computer to test conjectures, uh, 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 problems related to problems uh, in, in, in uh, geometry topology and of course dy dynamical systems. He is also very well known for, for giving very good public lectures. He has done this uh, in quite a number of countries, in, in Germany, in Russia, in Serbia. And of course, this time in Singapore, uh, Professor Zoro was, was invited speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 2006 uh, in recognition of his outstanding work in, in the field. So this afternoon, he'll give a lecture. The title is Butterflies, Cats, and Billiards. Please welcome Professor Zoro. Thank you very much for kind, wor kind words. Thank you for the invitation and thank, thanks to everybody for coming. It's a special pleasure to give public lectures because uh, usually people who come to public lectures are just sincerely interested in mathematics, like it very much, and they, they are curious. I'm exactly the same, I love mathematics and I'm curious and it's very, it's a great pleasure to, to share these feelings. So, Dynamical systems is one of the branches of mathematics which is not very well known in public and one of the main goals of this lecture is to give an idea of what are dynamical systems. And let me start with some something which does not look like probably as dynamical system but it would be just one of the examples. One, later it would appear one more time and it would be already more dynamical. So, my first example is Fibonacci sequence. Well, this is something really well, well known. This is a sequence of numbers which, is, which starts with 0 and 1. And every next number is defined in terms of the previous two by this simple rule. And here is a calculation for, of the first several terms of Fibonacci sequence. It's very popular. You read Da Vinci Code and you see that to look a code in a Swiss bank, you absolutely need to know uh, Fibonacci sequence, so it's a very useful in real life. Um, and since I'm speaking about Fibonacci sequence, probably I should mention several words about Fibonacci himself. So he would be very surprised to be famous for the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, I was very much surprised when I learned when he lived. He is born in 1170, so much earlier than I expected. And so he was a son of a merchant of Pisa who sent as a customs officer, who was sent as a customs officer, his father was sent as a customs officer to uh, North Africa and uh, his son uh, spent some time in uh, Egypt, Algeria, Syria, so traveled a lot, and he learned there the way merchants there counted things. So they used Arabic numbers, not the Roman ones and, as in Italy, and he realized that it's way easier to count using our usual, what, what now is our usual decimal system, and when he came back to to Pisa, he wrote a book uh, which was called the Book of Calculations, 
which became extremely popular in a short time. He had, well, the book was unwritten, but he had uh, the second edition in his life. Uh, he was the first tenure professor in Europe because merchants of uh, Pisa um, accorded him their life-wise rent for his achievements. And as an example of how easy can the calculation using Arabic numbers, well, Arabic digits, uh, he used this Fibonacci sequence, which was actually already known by this time to Indians and so on, and he even used an interpretation in population dynamics because this Fibonacci sequence was propagation of population of rabbits in his example. Anyway, so now I suggest to study Fibonacci sequence not all alone, but as a member of a family of sequences. Uh, when I showed my slides to my father, who is a professional mathematician, uh, he looked at the slides and asked me afterwards, what's the message of your talk? So since even my father didn't guess what is the message of the talk, there, there are several ones, so I will pronounce them explicitly. So one of the messages, to my mind, in more mathematics, one of the main ideas of mathematics of 20th and 21st century is do not study objects individually, try to consider them in families. So study surfaces or curves or whatever as members of moduli space, study Fibonacci sequence as a member of a family of sequences. Your life would be much easier if you find some structure in the family. So here, this is an illustration. So I suggest to consider Fibonacci sequence as a member of a family of sequences which satisfies this equation, so please memorize this equation, it's the main equation for next 10 minutes. Mm, and one can notice, this I do not explain why one should expect it, but one can notice that there are two geometric progressions among sequences which satisfy this equation. So suppose that some geometric progression satisfies this equation, so this is the equation for this would, what, what would it give for a geometric progression? Because the kth term of geometric progression is like this. And now we can simplify this equation, and we'll get equation 1 plus lambda equals lambda squared. Quadratic equation, you can solve it easily. There are two roots. There are two distinct roots, one like this, another like this. So this root is greater than 1. This root is negative and smaller than 1 by absolute value. So there are two exactly two geometric progressions which satisfy the Fibonacci recurrence relation. So we'll call them U and W. Now, several observations. And for, so first observation is that the sum of any two solutions of Fibonacci recurrence relation is also a solution. When I'm saying solution, I don't mean three numbers, I mean all the sequence, all the numbers of the sequence, if you put your equation at the right place, then having two sequences which already satisfy this relation, you can take the sum of the sequences in a natural way, and you will also get a sequence with such, which satisfies this relation. Also, you can multiply all the numbers of the sequence by number 5 or 23 or square root of 2, whatever, and you also get a solution. And finally, one more observation is that the first two terms of any solution of this recurrence relation uniquely defines the entire sequence. Because you will then co compute the third term, fourth term, and so on, and you can go everywhere. Okay, excellent. Now, I suggest the following. Uh, at the end of the day, we're interested in Fibonacci sequence, which starts with the numbers 0 and 1. I suggest temporarily forget about sequences and work with vectors in the plane. Uh, I don't know whether you studied it in course of mathematics or physics, but when you have two forces, you can compute the sum of two vectors and express the sum of these vectors. And also, if you have two vectors which are not collinear and you have third vector, you can compute, you can take the first one with appropriate coefficient, the second with appropriate coefficient, and as a sum, you get 
the one which you are interested in. We are interested in, in this particular vector, and by the reasons which will be clear in a second, I want to use as two basic vectors, vectors 1 lambda 1 and 1 lambda 2, where lambda 1 and lambda 2 are square uh, roots of our quadratic equation. Excellent. So I still do not know what are the coefficients uh, of this representation, but I am trying to express this vector, 0, 1, as sum of a vector which is collinear to this guy and collinear to this guy. So I have to find C1 and C2. If you write this equation in coordinates, you get a system of linear equations, of two linear equations in two unknown variables, and you can easily solve it, and you find the answer. This is the answer. Good. What does it give? Well, according to observations one and two, uh, if we consider the sequence, which I will call A, which is sequence U, our first geometric progression, multiplied by C1, plus sequence W, our second geometric progression, multiplied by C2, I will get a sequence which has this formula, which would be a solution of Fibonacci recurrence relation. But also, according to our third observation, the first two terms of the sequence determine the entire sequence. And the first two terms of this sequence were, by our choice, 0 and 1. Meaning that this sequence is nothing but our Fibonacci sequence. Now, this is, to my mind, first funny thing, because here is a formula, algebraic formula for the nth term of Fibonacci sequence, and looking at this thing, it's difficult to believe that this number is integer number. Well, there are radicals here, right? Uh, the second observation is that basically, from the point of view of not algebraist, but of somebody in, well, of, of not formal mathematician, but somebody who, who works in, who lives in the real life, you see, the second geometric sequence, we have seen that the absolute value of this lambda 2, the absolute value of this number is 0 0.6 approximately. When you take this number power 100, it just disappears. It's almost 0. So meaning that the nth term of Fibonacci sequence is approximately, with a very good precision for large n, is just this number, which is not at all integer, but which is incredibly close to integer number. Also, since we have such a f simple form, uh, we can compute easily the approximate value of large term of Fibonacci sequence. Let's pass to logarithms. The logarithm of our number is log 10 of this coefficient plus n log 10 of this number. So. Probably I have to show you once more this form. So here's the form. Take the logarithm of this expression. You will get logarithm of this coefficient plus n times logarithm of what we have in the brackets, right? Okay. Now, I computed approximately the value of the first logarithm and the value of this logarithm. This is the, the first value. This is the second one. Now, what is the relation between decimal logarithm of a very huge number and number of digits in this number. It's basically the same. They differ by one. So if you want to compute how many digits contains the, for example, the term number 1000 of Fibonacci sequence, you have to compute the decimal logarithm of this thing, uh, add one and pass to their integer part of this number. So we'll get this thing. So I expect approximately 209 digits. Here is the number. It indeed com contains 209 digits. And this is, so speaking about applications of what I'm telling, one of applica possible applications is you can frighten your grandparents or impress your friends, saying that you can, just by mental calculation, compute the term number 10,000 of Fibonacci sequence in a, uh, Fibonacci sequence in a split second, just memorize these two numbers, and that's it. OK. Um, now, 
I already promised to speak not only about Fibonacci sequence, because, but about brothers and sisters of Fibonacci sequence. And let me discuss one of the two geometric progressions which satisfies the recurrence relation defining Fibonacci sequence. And I'm interested in the uh, geometric progression which has the root which is smaller than one by absolute value, this one. Okay. I suggest to compute this sequence on computer. Actually, it's stupid because we know what happens with this sequence. It's geometric progression where the common term is, by absolute value, strictly smaller than one. When you take power 100, it would be basically zero. And when you compute on a computer with, I don't know, 16 digits precision or whatever, it would very fast, it would be, it's supposed to, to become just zero. Now, here's a maple program for computation. You see, it's extremely, it's not dangerous at all. The only operation which I use, which I'm using is I take sum of two numbers. I do not divide by anything at any time, which sometimes is dangerous when you divide by something which is close to zero. And so it's extremely elementary. You can use whatever language, programming language you prefer and your, your favorite computer. The only thing, please, oops, please memorize the first two terms of the sequence not in algebraic way with radicals, but approximately, as computer works with numbers. So here is what computer gives as an answer for the term number 100. It tells that it's approximately 10 power 11, which is, see, it cannot be as bad, as, so it's sort of the, the, the worst thing which can happen. Instead of something which is 10 power minus 21, it shows 10 power 11. You see, it's the difference, well, the ratio is 10 power 32. It's a disaster. So, no, there are no problems with Intel, Intel processor or whatever, or any other processor. You can, t you can choose any, any computer. And maybe the error, d depending on how many digits it used for floating calculations, uh, maybe the error would be not that bad, but you can pass to term, not 100, but I don't know, 200, and it would be already disastrous. So I suggest, well, first, I'm happy because somehow the common idea right now is that computers can do everything. No. Uh, and also, they can give very wrong things with a very simple program. You have to know what is beyond. And you have to know what you are working with, and to understand what happened and why computer, why, why we managed to make such a confusion with computer, I suggest to study the recurrence relation defining Fibonacci sequence geometrically. Namely, I suggest to consider the following transformation of the plane. So I consider points of the plane as vectors with two components, x and y, and I consider the transformation which sends a point x, y to the point y, x plus y. Why not? I defined formally what I am doing with the plane. I am applying some transformation. We'll discuss geometry of this transformation in, in two minutes. Right now, I'm defining it still formally. So if we take two consecutive elements like this, uh, and, well, like this and like this of Fibonacci sequence, and consider them as plane vectors, then the transformation f sends the first vector to this one. This is definition of transformation f, but this is exactly the next vector in our sequence. So our transformation, so you, you chop out of your sequence two consecutive numbers, consider them as a vector, apply transformation f of the plane, and the vector which you get is the next uh, two numbers considered as a vector. Okay, so if we want to compute large term of any sequence or Fibonacci-like sequence which satisfies our recurrence relation, just take the initial vector and apply transformation F many times. Every time we shift by one and we'll get to this vector. Okay, now let us ch 
see what happens with our two distinguished sequences which satisfies Fibonacci recurrence relation. Let's study what happens with geometric progressions. So this un and wn. We have two very distinguished sequences, geometric progressions. And for geometric progressions, so the nth factor is like this. The n minus first vector is like this. So this vector is collinear to the previous one. So for this geometric progressions, the transformation is particularly simple. You take the vector, and the transformation, either for the first geometric progression, it expands it by coefficient lambda 1, and for the second sequence, it contracts it with coefficient uh, lambda 1. Excellent. Now, I suggest to play exactly the same game as we already played. If you have any vector, just decompose it as the sum of two vectors, one, sorry, one collinear uh, to, uh, yeah, I have to point here, one collinear to the vector u of the first geometric progression, where is it? Somewhere, it's, it should be one, one lambda one. And this, yes, here. And the vector w corresponds to the second geometric progression. It's one lambda two. So, and any vector you can re represent as vector collinear to u plus vector collinear to w with some coefficients c1, c2, which depend on b. And then if you represent your vector v in these terms, then v is sent to f of v, which is c1 f of, d, f of u plus c2 f of w. One can ch we have already seen that implicitly that f sends sum of two vectors uh, to some of their images, and a vector multiplied by a number to its image multiplied by the same number. So for those who had course of linear algebra, I'm speaking about vector spaces and linear transformation. Uh, anyway, what is important, no matter how it's called, we have this formula, and it uses the same two properties which we already have seen for Fibonacci sequence. Now, finally, I'm coming back to dis discussing what happens with the plane when we apply transformation f. Well, we've just seen what happens. So we have two vectors, u and w. In direction u, everything is expanded with coefficient lambda. In direction w, everything is contracted with coefficient lambda. And in between, it's something which interpolates these two things. So if we take a unit circle, the unit circle will be sent to an ellipse where the large demi x is in direction of vector u and the small one in direction of vector w. Now, if you apply this transformation many times, then your plane would be basically smashed completely to direction of the larger demi x and expanded enormously in this direction. So, again, for those who had a course of linear algebra, we know that the transformation like this is uh, non-degenerate, so the plane is mapped perfectly well to the plane, but from the point of view of an engineer or, I don't know, computer graphics, if you apply power 10 of this transformation, or especially power 100 of this transformation, it's extremely degenerate. Just completely squeeze the entire plane to the line and then spread this line very long. Okay, now we understand the structure of our transformation and now I can explain why we managed to make computer crazy. So, we wanted to iterate our map starting from a point which lives on this contracting semi-x. But computer does not memorize the point exactly. That's why I insisted that your computer, you have to work not with algebraic representation of number, but with a floating point representation, which is, which creates slight mistakes. So the blue point is the point is the way computer memorizes your red point. Now, when you start applying your transformation, what happens? The red point, the true red point, the true geometric progression, it goes 
along this contracting line. But since there was some mistake, this mistake starts to accumulate. So if our initial vector was not exactly w, but w plus u with a very small coefficient epsilon, then after two n iterations, you will have lambda 2 power to n times w, which is already something very small. But here, we have still very small epsilon, but multiplied by lambda 1 power to n. And lambda 1 power to n become gigantic. So this thing, which initially was a tiny little mistake, would create a trouble. And starting from some point, you see, it explodes. So, speaking about messages, one, so this is here an illustration of one more message. I worked for three years at the early stage of my career in a programming lab. I swear it is very important to understand what is the structure of the thing you are programming. Otherwise, you can get something completely wrong without any hint what's going wrong. So it's important to understand really what is beyond the thing with which you are working. Here, for example, we started with Fibonacci sequence, so it's just sequ one sequence of numbers. And to understand in full extent everything which is related to it, it's very practical to consider geometric interpretation of this, the corresponding transformation, and so on. OK. Also, this is an illustration, the first illustration of what is known as butterfly effect. So we observed, the, this is to my mind the easiest interpretation of phenomenon of instability of trajectory with respect to the starting data. You see, arbitrary small, arbitrary tiny error make your very special trajectory escape to infinity instead of landing to the origin. So in much more complicated context of um, weather prediction, uh, this effect was presented by American meteorologist Lawrence uh, in a very expressive manner. He, su he, he suggested the question, does the flap over butterfly wings in Brazil can set a tornado in Texas? So probably, yeah. I, if I will have time, I will tell you about the, or, well, probably right now. It would be sort of a break. You, you will have a chance to relax. So to my mind, the origin of the word butterfly effect is a short story of American writer Ray Bradbury, which is called uh, Sound of Thunder, which describes the following thing. So some sort of semi-legal company uh, organizes a safari, but not the usual one, but safari in time. If you pay really a lot of money, they send you to some prehistoric era where you can hunt dinosaurs. And they are very smart because they compute everything. They somehow travel in time and they pick up dinosaurs who are condemned to die. And they send people to hunt them just like one minute or two minutes be, be, be before the natural death because they are very much afraid of the effects, side effects, which can create intervention in the past. And at some point, they send, uh, well, a very wealthy guy to, for this time safari, and he panics. And instead of following some pre predetermined path, he makes sort of several steps outside, and he taps over a butterfly. And this is realized when he comes back to this sort of time space-time shuttle. And the organizer is extremely angry with him and says that you are dead if something is wrong when we come back. And they come back and they see that everything is the same, but there are slight differences. Orthograph is slightly different. And the results of the elections, of presidential elections, are completely different. I'm starting to suspect that some illegal company <laughs> finally managed to realize this Machine. OK. Uh, in dynamical systems, one studies the behavior of transformation after many iterations. So uh, the main sort of 
Dynamical systems usually cannot tell you what will happen in one minute. But similar to the way we have easily calculated the term number 1000 of Fibonacci sequence, not exactly, but very well approximately. This is sort of the goal of dynamical systems. Wait for a long time, term of time, will tell you what happened. Or rather, will tell you what are the averages and so on. Now, let me speak about, I was up to now, I was speaking about the plane. Now, let me speak about the torus. I suggest, yeah, torus is this guy. If you don't like the word torus, it's the tube of the, well, the bike tube. And I suggest to map it to itself. So one of the ways to obtain torus is to glue it from a square. You take two opposite sides of the square, you glue it together, you get the cylinder. And now I'm assuming that my square is done from a rubber, and I can take two opposite sides of the cylinder, glue them together, and I get this bike tube, and I call it a cylinder. Now, this is the object. What are the ways to map this object to itself, to sort of put, you, you start with two identical bike cameras, bike tubes, and you want to send one to another by continuous transformation. So, for those who had already actions of the groups and so on, one of the, the algebraic way to see this is to consider two-dimensional torus as the quotient of the plane R2 over the action of, of the group Z plus Z, of integer translations. That is, consider real components of a vector in R modulo Z. Only consider a fractional part. And then, our transformation of the plane, which we considered several minutes ago, x, y sent, is sent to y, x plus y, defines a well-defined continuous map of the torus to itself. But this is an algebraic definition. This is abstract. I suggest a simple-minded one. So let me construct the desired transformation of the torus in several iterations. So, and here, we have already seen butterflies. Now we'll see the cat. So, to illustrate this transformation, uh, Vladimir Arnold wrote a cat like this and considered the image of this cat, cat on a torus. So, the three iterations, which three consecutive maps, which I will iterate of the torus to itself, are as follows. First one is very easy to represent on the level of the square from which I glue my torus. So, you just take your square and you turn it by 90 degrees and put it to itself. Now, this is easy. What is not so easy is to convince yourself that this defines not only a map of a square to itself, but of a torus to itself. The map is somehow crazy because it sends meridians to uh, parallels and parallels to meridians. One has to spend five minutes staring at this picture to convince himself that, yes, it is a well-defined map of a torus to itself. Now, the next map is Again, very simple in terms of a square. You just flip your square over this vertical line. And in terms of the torus, you make a tiny hole in the torus, put your hand inside, wrap it upside down, and put it on itself. Not so easy to imagine. You have to look at this picture and to convince yourself that on the formal level, it really defines a well-defined map of a torus. And the last one, yeah, I compose them. The last one is this one. So you slant your square by 45 degrees. And now, since we to get the torus, I have to identify this side to that side, this side to that side. I can do the following. I can first take a pair of scissors, cut my parallelogram here, glue it here, and then I will get a square and I will identify opposite sides. So this is their definition in terms of this pattern. In terms of the torus, so you have a torus, cut it open to a cylinder again. So we have a, so imagine you have a vertical cylinder and now do the following. You do not touch the circle at the bottom. The circle which is slightly higher, you turn a little bit. The circle which is slightly higher, you turn a bit more. And when you get to the top, 
you make a full turn and you glue back your circles again. And so you are sort of progressively twisting your torus over itself. This map is called Den Twist. So I am composing all these three maps. And one can check, yeah, so this is the, the image of the cat. You have to now glue the opposite sides of the torus, uh, of the square to get the torus, and you will see the cat on the torus. This is the map, and one can check that locally, in tiny, small, flat coordinate system, the map is defined exactly by the same matrix as we started before. So locally, there is just no difference between this map of a torus to itself and the map of the plane to itself, which was studied. Now, why I'm so excited about this? Because we already have all information about what would happen with orbits of this map locally. Imagine that you start with some point P0. We probably have to show the picture. So consider some point, some black point, and consider their trajectory. Now I will apply my map many, many times, and I consider the trajectory of this point. At the current stage, I'm not interested in trajectory by itself. I'm interested in the following question. Let's make a tiny mistake and consider a nearby, po nearby point. How would two trajectories behave, one with respect to another? And what we already studied gives us all needed information to answer this question, because locally, it is exactly the transformation of the plane which we started. So if we take a vector which does not go in this red direction of the contracting uh, uh, geometric sequence of the contracting vector, then this vector will, so we know that this circle or this disk become ellipse and then ellipse which is completely disproportional. So any vector like this, will very fast become very long, meaning that for almost any slight deformation of the initial point, the trajectories would forget about, would, would disperse very, very fast way. And only if we manage to put, and now in a, really in an algebraic manner, as right with radicals, if we move our point in this direction, in the contracting, contracting direction of that, on the contrary, the two trajectories would approach one another in a very fast way. So this kind of dynamic, now this is already a dynamical system of the torus. I have a map of the torus to itself, and I wrap my torus to itself two times, three times, four times, in, a, in, in each time applying the same wrapping as before. So I am making 100 iteration of this wrapping, I'm studying what happens with trajectory. What we observed, that the vast majority of trajectories just disperse in a very fast way, and this kind of maps are called chaotic. So, speaking about dynamical systems, the father of dynamical systems, to my mind, is Henri Poincaré. Uh, he his, and, and basically, one concrete paper of Henri Poincaré, which, is, which, which was treating the uh, three-body problem, he was actually interested in stability of the solar system. But in, well, there was some mistake in this um, paper, which to my mind does not diminish the role of this paper, because this paper gave birth to two extremely, now extremely developed sciences, dynamical systems and topology. So the concepts, the structures which, we, which he introduced in this paper are just incredible. He, he, he recognized something so important that it was studied afterwards during the entire 20th century and is still studied now. And so, yes, and now, get prepared, I will formulate a theorem, uh, which is sort of technical. Don't worry, I will start over right after this slide, but still let me try to formulate 
a theorem. But for, as a preparation for the theorem, let me pronounce the two very important properties of the map, which wraps, which we consider this very particular map, which wraps the torus over itself. First, it preserves the area. The reason why it preserves the area is because in, I mean the flat area which comes from the unit square. The reason is simple-minded. You can consider a tiny square and a tiny parallelogram to which is mapped our tiny square and it is mapped by the, the way which we know. You just take scalar product, you measure, you see that the area didn't change. But if the area didn't change for a tiny parallel uh, square, it wouldn't, you, you can cover any complicated figure with tiny squares and, and you will have measure preser area preservation. Excellent. And the second thing which I do not prove, but please trust me, uh, any subset invariant under our transformation either has zero area or it has full area. So the, you cannot find some tricky, complicated subset, which is really non-trivial, has non-trivial area between zero and one, which is mapped to itself and pre is preserved. So you cannot decompose your torus into two parts where dynamics is independent. Okay, in this, in such a situ situation when these two properties are preserved, the map is called ergodic. So we have an ergodic map. And here is a statement of a true real life theorem, very important. So for any continuous function of the torus and for almost any starting point, I do not define almost any, but apply your intuition. The mi so you can do the following things. So you, you have some function, for example, temperature which is different. You imagine that you arrive to some asteroid which has uh, the form of a torus. And you want to measure the average temperature on your asteroid. And the temperature is different in different parts of the asteroid. And well, you can cover the entire torus with tiny squares and go to every single square and try to, to count the average. It would take enormous amount of time. It's complicated. Their alternative way is the following. Send your satellite in the direction which is given by this transformation. Suppose that after one hour, your satellite arrives from the initial point to the point F of the initial point. And measure the temperature every hour. Follow your trajectory. And take the average along your trajectory, which is chaotic. This average would be exactly the average temperature over the asteroid. So your trajectory covers your asteroid very in a very on a long scale. Your trajectory covers your asteroid in a very regular way. In particular, it visits any tiny island of the asteroid, and visit is the number of visits to this tiny island is proportional to the area of the island. And here I should say that I do not like the word chaotic. To my mind, it gives wrong intuition because chaotic dynamical systems, they are chaotic on a short scale of time. They are extremely regular on a long scale of time. They behave as if all, almost all points follow one and the same sort of closed trajectory which fills the entire space in a very regular way. So this is, to my mind, much, much better image of chaotic dynamical system. Okay. I have to rush because I still want to say several words about billiards. And my billiards are different from the usual ones, as you see. And also I have to give some, to present some excuses for studying billiards. So let's study something much more serious. Let's study a gas in a chamber, but as seen, since I am a mathematician, I always simplify the model. So my chamber is one-dimensional. So my gas lives on this uh, segment. And I have only two molecules. One would be overkill. Two, it's already interesting. So molecules cannot go beyond the walls. And also, it's not quantum billiard. 
They cannot go one through the other. They collide and then they split. So if you write down the coordinates of two molecules as x1, x2, then you see 0 is less than x1, less than x2, less than a. I'm, I suppose that the radius of the ball is very, very small. I neglect it. I pretend that it's 0. So the two coordinates x1, x2 live in this triangle. And when my molecules move, I have some line which moves inside this triangle. Let me rescale a little bit my coordinates. Uh, namely, I will... Uh, not mine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm playing billiards, but it's a different game. Uh, so let me rescale with these factors. So I change slightly the shape of this billiard. And now, very cute observation. In coordinates, in this new rescale coordinates, the trajectory of the system of these two balls is nothing but a billiard in the triangle. So every collision of the balls with a wall or between them is a collision with one of the sides of the triangle. OK, so this is already an excuse for studying billiards. Studying billiards, I'm studying a simplified model of a Lorentz gas in one dimensional chamber. And another excuse is that actually the problem is not that easy. So if you consider an acute triangle, the triangle where all the angles are less than 90 degrees, it's very easy to find a closed trajectory. And this is a very nice problem in elementary geometry to prove that the uh, inscribed triangle, which has sides, uh, sorry, which has vertices at the points which are the basis of the heights of our triangle, so triangle like this, this is a height of triangle, this is a height of triangle, and this is the third height. You join these three points, you get a triangle. So nice problem in elementary geometry, not completely trivial, prove that this triangle is a billiard trajectory. Also for those who like physics, prove that this triangle has the minimal possible perimeter among all inscribed triangles. So if you put an elastic band on the frame, on the triangular frame, this elastic band would contract to this shape. Okay, this is for acute triangles. And now, one of the messages of this talk is to present open problems and in open problem is, is there a single closed billiard trajectory in any obtuse triangle? So after the Fermat's theorem is proved, to my mind, this problem has the best rate of simplicity of statement and complexity of the proof. So it is known for several hundred years. There are recent computer-assisted proofs that, for example, all triangles with obtuse angle at most 100 degrees, but 100 was chosen sort of by random, do have closed billiard trajectories. But suppose that even, some, for example, using some computer-assisted proof, someone would prove that uh, there is one. The next question would be, but how many? How many closed billiard trajectories of lengths less than, I don't know, 10,000 kilometers can you find in a triangle? completely open, no, no idea how to, how to work, deal with this. Another open problem is the billiard flow ergodic in almost any triangle. No idea. Well, not to finish the talk with this very pessimistic note that even for such simple-minded problems we don't know the answers, let us consider billiard where plenty of things can be done. Let's start with the most simple-minded billiard, the usual one, in a rectangle. Now, the very convenient approach to studying billiard trajectories in a rectangle is the following. Instead of making the trajectory uh, get reflected from the side, let's reflect the billiard. Let's just put a mirror here and look what would happen with the trajectory in the mirror quality. Well, you know perfectly well what would happen. What is, does it mean billiard trajectory? It's like light. So this angle is the same as this one. 
So in the mirror, this angle is the same as this one, but this means that this is just a straight line. So when I'm reflecting the billiard table, my trajectory is extended just as a straight line. So, and if I consider a long piece of trajectory and every time I reflect my billiard table, I get just a straight line. Well, okay, I simplify the trajectory. I made my life with unwrapped billiard complicated. Let's try to find a compromise. First, know that a billiard trajectory moves at any time in one of the four directions. So I know, mark them in red, blue, green, and yellow. And I also noted them here a them. So I suggest to identify all partners of the rectangle where the trajectory has the same color by a parallel translation. So you can know that the same color if I orient my billiard table using the letters A, B, C, D. So here we have red color and A, B, C, D. Here we have red color and A, B, C, D. So the orientation is the same. So I suggest to identify all rectangles having the same orientation by a parallel translation. And then I need only, instead of infinite number of copies of billiard table, I need only four copies. So I have four colors, I need four copies. And also upon this identification, what happens? I'm, so I, th this is my four copies, but note that I'm identifying everything by parallel translation, this side AB would be identified with this side AB, BA with BA. You, you have already seen this picture. Instead of four rectangles, I get a torus. I identify the two horizontal sides and two vertical sides. I get exactly the same torus as before. And my billiard trajectory becomes a winding line on this torus. So this is really a good compromise. Studying winding line on a torus is way easier than studying this complicated combinatorics of billiard trajectory. Now, let's pass to billiards which are slightly more complicated. Let's consider a billiard in a triangle, but not in an arbitrary triangle for which I said that I cannot do anything, but in a triangle which has uh, all angles which are rational multiples of pi. Here, for example, you see an example of triangle like this. What did we do with their billiard in a rectangle? We started to unfold it. Let's do the same thing here. And one can check that unfolding, oops, sorry, unfolding my triangle to this regular octagon and identifying opposite sides, I, went, I, I will get a complete analog of what happened with the billiard in a rectangle. I will get instead of a, poly, a billiard and a polygon, I will get a winding line on a closed surface. So for the rectangle, the closed surface was the torus. For this guy, we'll get something more interesting. So let's see what happens if we identify opposite sides of a regular octagon. Well, imagine your regular octagon as a square with four corners which are chopped out. We know how to identify opposite sides of a square, right? We get a torus. But since we chopped out the four corners, we'll get a torus with a hole. This hole has a form of a smaller square. Now let me cheat a little bit because I cannot draw it. I'm not so good in drawing. I will turn this hole by 45 degrees and I will join the two opposite sides once again. Now I'll get a torus with two remaining holes, the two remaining pair of sides, and when I glue them together, I get a torus with a handle. In topology, it's called surface of genus two. So I got a torus with a handle, a surface of genus two, which is perfectly flat, and I'm instead of billiard trajectory in initial triangle, I'm studying a winding line on the surface of genus 2. Now, for those who had, I have several colleagues in the hall, don't worry, there is no contradiction with the gauss bonnet theorem, because I have cheated a little bit. So, sorry, I have to return, ah, no, I don't need. So, 
I am identifying all the sides of the regular octagon by all pairs of opposite sides of reg regular octagon, all the vertices would be identified to a single point, and we'll have a conical singularity in this point. So conical singularity is something like this. So I really glue my surface from a paper, and the only trouble, I cannot glue it inside R3, I have to glue it abstractly, and the only trouble is that I will have one single point of this type, and my billiard trajectory became something which is called a geodesic. Geodesic is the following thing. We glued everything from the paper. In the paper, we have straight lines. When we glue this together, the straight lines take more complicated shape. For example, consider the following exercise. Uh, take a piece of paper and really and draw a line on this piece of paper. And then make Things like this. So an exercise, what will happen to a line? It will be somehow wrap around the cone. And it is very, to my mind, it's a very nice exercise to study whether this line will spin to the conical point or it will first spin and then will come back. How many turns will it make? Can it oscillate? Plenty of questions already for this thing. You can do it just practically. Draw a straight line and on a transparent or semi-transparent paper and wrap it and see what, what happens. Or you can do it, make it geometrically. And now I arrived to the, basically to the end of the talk. Um, we have seen that to study Fibonacci sequence, it was extremely practical to put it inside a family of sequences, for those who had linear algebra inside of uh, two-dimensional vector space, study the entire vector space and then come back to the concrete sequence. So if you want to study this, well, this flow on some flat surface, it happens that it is very useful to consider not only this particular individual surface, but a finite dimensional family of surfaces. And instead of studying this particular flow, it is very useful to start, start deforming the surface inside this family, and you get dynamics of surfaces. And in particular, you deform your surface, and then at some point you come back, and what you get is something which resembles our map of a torus to itself, which wraps a torus over itself, and so on. And studying these dynamics is basically the solution of all problems related with the billiards in rational billiards and so on. And uh, I cannot, since I'm out, basically I exceeded all my time, I can just mention that, well, this problem was, uh, this dynamics of surfaces was studied for last 40 years and, well, probably the, one of the first, first persons who studied it very deeply was Bill Thurston. And recently, a group of researchers, Alex, Alex Eskin, Amir Mohammadi, and Maria Mirzahani, well, and also Simon Philippe, have obtained some incredible results about dynamics of these complex geodesics and families of surfaces. Uh, just one more word why I'm saying that it's completely fantastic. When you consider most of chaotic dynamical systems, I said that they're very regular, actually, on a long scale of time. Yes, for almost all starting points. But we have seen with this red sequence that some very specific orbits behave completely differently. And for most of chaotic systems, all the zoo of possible trajectories is sort of in, it's impossible to describe them. You have very, very complicated, very rare, but very complicated trajectories which fill some cantor-like cantor sets and so on. No way to describe all trajectories. What did these guys is that described all possible trajectories. It happened that all possible trajectories, it's possible to describe them, and they have very nice geometric structure. And this was one of the results which gave to Maria Mirzahani the Fields Medal at the last um, ICM. 
So, two last two messages. First, it was extremely practical to consider families of surfaces and not one surface. And the second message concerns this slide. So the message is addressed to, to the girls sitting in this hall. So I, this night I got a message from my former graduate student uh, saying that she finally got a permanent position. She was very happy and she was sort of grateful. To my mind, the only thing, well, I, I tried to explain a lot of mathematics to her and then it was enormous pleasure to work with her because she is absolutely brilliant. But to my mind, the only thing which I did for her, I convinced her that she is extremely smart. And somehow I realized it was the first time when I heard, had a graduate student, a girl, I had to repeat to her every two weeks that she is extremely smart. And, and somehow she, she had no self-confidence for, for, for quite a lot of time. I, and she is extremely smart. It was not, not just a, a cheap compliment. So please believe you are smart. <laughs> Take the example. Do, well, it is normal for everybody, for boys and for girls, to have hesitations, not to help them from time to time self cost But for girls, somehow, it, it, is, it, it, it the, the limits are, well, the measure is completely different. I could, I didn't know it before, actually. And, and then I started to speak with my female colleagues and, and women co colleagues, and I realized that it's very common, especially on the very early stage of career. So this is normal. Take the example. You will, you will do it. So this is the last slide. This is an artistic picture of billiard and a polygon. Thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions, comments? Anyone? In general triangles? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it, 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 oh, yeah. Uh, no, currently, completely suspended. So it is. There is no point of trying to push it to, I don't know, to, to 110 degrees, making this computer-assisted proof 10 times more complicated. It's already very difficult to, to check it. And up to the best of my knowledge, for this closed billiard trajectory, there is no idea, even vague idea, how to affront this problem. For the second problem, for ergodicity of uh, billiards in polygons, it seems like it seems that uh, Giovanni Forni, a mathematician from University of Maryland, has very serious approach for proving finally ergodicity in foregones and more, and there are some technical problems which do not ap let apply his technique to triangles. So triangles are still, it's somehow, triangle is the simplest polygon. It resists. Any other question? This question about uh, this, uh, you're talking about simulation, computer errors, and so on and so forth. So what happens, uh, will you, uh, how much confidence do you have in, uh, when, you, when you write a computer program trying to simulate a dynamical system, will it actually uh, give you a different picture of what actually happens because of the computing errors? Uh, when I write 
a program for the first simulation, I have no confidence at all, so zero confidence. But then I'm trying to find some completely independent experiment, and also there are particular cases and so on, and when several completely different experiments match, this gives me a confidence. And also I should say that basically I'm writing these uh, computer simulations mostly by pure curiosity. I'm absolutely impatient to know what is the structure, what is the answer, what is the truth. Usually there is no way to, to prove anything for long, long, for many, for decennies sometimes, but I'm impatient to know what's the answer. And often computer simulations, especially when several completely different computer simulations provide you with the answer, they give a hint for a conjecture, then you make a conjecture, and then at least you expect that you know the, the, the truth. When it would be proved formally, rigorously, mathematically, sometimes it takes a year, sometimes 10, sometimes 20, sometimes I wouldn't be alive. <laughs> but it's, the curiosity is somehow above everything. I didn't know whether I replied the question, but. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, uh, but somehow, Billiard in ellipse is way easier. It is integrable. So, but uh, billiards in so, sort of composed figures are well studied. Well, billiards are very well studied. For example, there is the notion of Sinai billiard. There are plenty of effects which are uh, somehow which were found in dynamical systems studying billiards. So many things are known. And I should say that it's sort of ironic that the figure which, to some sense, seems to be the easiest possible, a triangle, what can be easier than a triangle? It, somehow, it, it shows to be sort of one of the most complicated ones. When you have a convex billiard, when, when, you, have, when you have several sort of gen, when, you, when your billiard shape is reasonable curve, plenty of things can be told. When your builder is, billiard is triangle, it's a nightmare. Yes? <sighs> um, up to the, I'm, well, these kind of things are studied by the domain which is called statistical physics. There are plenty of things which are done. And there are experts in the room here, nearby. Yeah, 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 here. Stefan, can you <laughs> raise the hand? <laughs> yeah. So I will forward your question to an expert. But without kidding, uh, already two-dimensional models are somehow not so easy to study. And for example, uh, there is, again, what can be easier than putting, say, for example, rectangular obstacles periodically in the plane. So I'm mimicking a crystal, and I send a billiard in this periodic billiard. And I can compute what would be the rate of propagation of the spot which is covered by trajectory. The model was suggested by... Uh, the couple of, well, the Paul and Tatiana Ehrenfest more than 100 years ago. And the rate of propagation was computed like three years ago, and it is absolutely crazy. If you, instead of rectangles, if you put round balls, the rate of propagation is square root of length of trajectory, which is sort of expected, known, fine. When you replace your balls with rectangles, the rate of propagation is length of trajectory power two-thirds. And this, two -thir this crazy two-thirds, you cannot, to my mind, it is, at least nowadays, it is impossible to obtain using all their modern technology, including 
things related to the Fields Medal of Maria Mirzahani and results of Eskin and well, yeah, the, the authors of these two thirds are Vincent Delacroix, um, Pascal Hubert, and Samuel Lelièvre. So my colleagues from France. But this is to just to illustrate that even simple mind, simple-minded models, even in two dimensions, are difficult to study, and it took hundred years to to find their diffusion rate. Uh, the, uh, don't be completely de desperate. There are plenty of things known for three-dimensional models, but not everything. Any more questions? Well, before we end this talk, I would like to present to uh, Professor Zara, on behalf of the um, Institute, a token of appreciation. It consists of a coffee mug, <laughs> uh, but uh, with the emblem of the IMS together with an open problem called Riemann hypothesis. I hope. <laughs> so in addition to the problem that was presented just now, open problem, here's another problem for everyone here to solve. Thanks a lot. So this ends the session this afternoon. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your interest. <laughs>